Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us today. I'm Jamie Guillory and I'm a research scientist working with RTI International. I'm pleased to be your moderator for the fourth webinar in RTI's Tech Talk series. With a focus on data modernization, the Tech Talk series provides opportunities to connect with our experts, exchange and share information, and integrate solutions to better connect, analyze, share, and leverage your data. Today, our experts will demonstrate how social media data can be leveraged to monitor and respond to emerging public health issues. Government health agencies increasingly need real-time, real-world data to inform surveillance, evaluation, regulatory, and communication efforts. Social media platforms generate vast amounts of rich data that reflect perceptions and behaviors of consumers, organizations, and industries. But with a constant stream of information from a cluttered media environment, where do you start and what signals should you be paying attention to? Today, we'll provide an interview overview of the types of data and insights that can be gathered from social media platforms. For example, consumer perceptions and use of products that impact public health and consumer responses to policies and key events. You'll also learn how to apply innovative data science methods to social media data to gain a better understanding of public health insights. You'll leave today's webinar with an understanding of how to use social media data to answer questions about audiences and issues important in your work, produce quicker insights than traditional data collection methods, and complement your existing surveillance processes. I'd like to start by introducing you to my colleagues and today's speakers. Anise Kim is a senior scientist and director of the Health Media Impact and Digital Analytics Program at RTI. Anise leads multidisciplinary research teams to design and implement social media monitoring solutions for government health agencies. Rob Chu is a senior research data scientist and program manager for RTI's data Center for Data Science. Rob works at the intersection of data science and public health with specialties in machine learning and natural language processing for social media. I'll now turn the presentation over to Anise to get us started. Great, thanks, Jamie. The pandemic laid bare the gaps in our current public health surveillance system. Today, it's not just infectious diseases, but the flow of information that spreads more quickly than our current surveillance systems can capture, making it really challenging to keep pace with changing trends. This is in large part due to all of the technological advances and the smart devices we can hold in the palm of our hands, which has enabled us to rapidly share, receive, and be influenced by information on a global scale. Social media platforms have created open spaces for people, organizations, and companies to gather, connect, and share information. And today, with nearly three quarters of the U.S. population using social media, these platforms generate vast amounts of rich data that reflect the behaviors and per perceptions of consumers, organizations, and industries, creating opportunities for researchers and public health agencies to examine and understand public opinion and behavior. So social media listening is um, the topic of today's webinar. Social listening um, is the process of collecting data from social platforms and forums on a chosen topic where the collected data is then analyzed to find trends and useful insights. Now in our experience, health agencies use social media to support needs in communication, surveillance, and policy regulation. Within communications, the health agencies may use social media data to gauge public response to health education campaigns, to identify and address misinformation, and to also identify influencers who may amplify campaign messages um, or agencies' messages, as well as also identifying detractors who may undermine um, agencies' messaging. Within surveillance, health agencies may want to use social media to monitor emerging products and health issues, identify emerging consumer perceptions and misperceptions about health, and also monitor emerging consumer health behaviors. Health agencies working within the realm of policies and regulations may use social media data to understand public support as well as opposition for policies, to identify potential impact of regulatory policies and unintended consequences, to monitor the marketplace for emerging products and any misleading claims, and to also monitor um, the marketplace for compliance and enforcement of regulations. 
Here are some examples of research questions we have used, we have addressed using social media listening. Um, so they're related to things like looking at how brands are marketing um, new nicotine products and consumers' perceptions and reaction to these products, how consumers are potentially um, going to respond to an upcoming ban on menthol cigarettes, how consumers are talking about using vaping products as a cigarette smoking cessation tool, um, and then within the surveillance space, looking at um, questions like how residents are discussing um, travel and travel safety during the COVID-19 pandemic, and what questions consumers may have about staying safe during the COVID-19 pandemic. So social media data can be a valuable data source for answering those types of research questions because data is available in real time. So you can identify and monitor changes in the public's knowledge and perceptions about these health topics as they're happening. Instead of having to wait after the fact, if you're relying on traditional data sources like surveys that are more time consuming and expensive to implement. There are also literally hundreds of billions of social media posts on wide range of topics for researchers to mine and analyze which is why some people think of social media as the world's largest focus groups for getting some of that first intelligence. You're also able to hear people's perceptions from their own voices as people are sharing information largely unprompted, so you're getting their um, opinions in an authentic and unfiltered um, perspective. Despite these benefits, there are also some challenges and limitations of this data as well. Um, social media users are not representative of the U.S. population, and just because people are on social media doesn't necessarily mean they're always posting online. Some data on social media is very limited, for example, data on geography and demographics of users. And some platforms have limited access to what data you can actually monitor. Social media ecosystem is diverse and the terms of use guidelines about what data you can access are continually um, changing. So it's really important to keep up to date on issues around data accessibility. So in this graphic, what we did was we placed social media platforms on a scale of data accessibility with platforms like Snapchat and TikTok being most restrictive in terms of what data is made publicly available for analysis. So all the way on the right-hand side of the spectrum with platforms like Reddit and Twitter having open access to all public historical posts that have not been deleted. In our experience, um, leveraging Twitter and Reddit data and social media analysis works well because of this open access and um, availability of historical data. Um, and also because they complement each other nicely, whereas Twitter is short form and helpful for current events and use information sharing, Reddit is long form and very detailed and rich, so you get a lot of um, insights of particular audience segments on topics of interest. And then you have um, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube in the middle where um, some of that data is open and available, but um, there's different sets of guidelines in terms of the terms of service about what you can actually access and monitor. When we engage in social media listening, we go through the following steps. First, we set up a study by identifying the research question, the time frame, and the best social media platforms for that particular study purpose to be able to answer those research questions. Next, we develop a search query to identify relevant conversations, and we go through an iterative process where we're reviewing some of the initial results and then refining the search query so that we can really uh, maximize our ability to identify as many relevant conversations about your topic while also excluding irrelevant and off-topic posts. Um, then we examine these results and analyze the conversation. Now, analysis can take on a lot of different forms, and we'll hit on some of these throughout the course of our presentation. Um, but here, for kind of high-level purposes, at a minimum, um, we, tend, we like to categorize the post into emergent themes, and this could be done either qualitatively or using computational methods. Um, and then we can complement these kinds of um, emergent theme analysis with some qualitative review and coding of posts because it's important to actually look at some of the posts to understand the context and the nature of the emergent themes. We then report out key metrics and findings. 
And those key metrics and findings may include um, things such as looking, reporting at the volume of conversations about your topic, um, key spikes when you're looking at those volume trends and what's driving those peaks, um, and then the top topics and emerging keywords and themes, as well as some illustrative sample posts that are related to those themes. So next I'm gonna just kind of walk through some examples um, for, um, from some of our work. So this was an analysis where we looked at um, conversations around emerging products. And this one was um, specifically about synthetic nicotine. Um, we were looking at conversations on um, Twitter and Reddit and um, the volume of conversation was um, pretty um, stable over this time period, but there were a couple key events that happened um, in October and September 2021 that really drove um, peaks. Announcements around um, banning synthetic nicotine pouches, as well as announcements um, that FDA made around um, regulation. We looked at some of the top emerging themes that came out and categorized them into um, these four themes. And then what we did was we also then did kind of a more of a qualitative analysis to understand some of those. And here's just some examples of those themes and some sample posts from Reddit um, that were related to those themes. So the key takeaway from this analysis was that consumers were discussing um, using synthetic nicotine pouches and other similar products to quit smoking and or vaping. And we um, relayed this information um, to our clients who were then thinking about how to then um, perhaps modify and update their surveys to capture some of this emerging behavior. And here's another example where we're looking at the um, potential impact of a policy. Um, in this particular one where we're looking at um, conversations around the federal menthol ban. Um, and again, um, conversations were pretty low and stable during this time period, but a huge peak in April of 2021 was when um, driven by FDA's announcement. When we looked at some of the conversations around it, um, these were the emerging themes that we saw um, about the role of government um, and a lot of um, themes related to the issue around race and ethnicity in terms of who would be most impacted by this regulation. Um, and so when we looked at the post with more of a qualitative analysis, and these are some sample um, sub-themes with um, sample posts from Twitter, um, a key takeaway from one of the themes was that consumers believe that the ban will increase policing among Black people and cause harm in Black communities. So this is an example of where this type of information can then help inform um, the communication team's um, you know, messaging strategy as they move forward um, with the evolution of this ban. So up to now, I've talked a lot about um, how to identify what is being shared on social media to understand public perceptions. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Rob, who will talk um, more about using data science methods to understand who is posting that content. Rob? Yeah, great, thank you, Anise. So as Anise mentioned, uh, data science is relevant to many components of social media listening and evaluation. From building robust data pipelines and user-centric web applications, developing models for natural language processing, information extraction and search. However, today in particular, we're gonna focus on an important application of data science for social media, and that is audience segmentation. So as Anise showed previously, using just the, the data and analytics available within social media listening platforms can cover many different and relevant use cases. However, additional user characteristics and demographics, such as age, geography, or gender, are often important to support the needs of public health surveillance and evaluation. And unfortunately, these are often unavailable or are inconsistently available across media sources, making it challenging to assess the heterogeneity of the attitudes and beliefs across groups or to determine if a campaign's target audience is being reached. So the goal of audience segmentation then is primarily to address two questions. One, who is posting on social media? And two, who is being exposed to this content. 
So given that we're missing these user characteristics of interest for audience segmentation, how do we go about actually doing this? One approach would be to do a qualitative deductive coding. So the first step in deductive coding is to determine the categories or codes of interest. Let's use age groups as an example and say we're interested in determining if users are teens or adults. We can then take a sample of users and review information about each by looking at what they post publicly online, such as their user profile, their posts, and their comments. You can then assign codes, in our case, age group, to each user based on your best professional judgment. The strengths of this approach are that it's conceptually easy to understand and explain to others. Though in practice, it can be challenging if the categories aren't clearly defined and understood by the coders, or if the information can't easily be discerned from the content. Some limitations to this approach are that coding can be manually taxing and time consuming. Additionally, this approach doesn't scale well if you want to apply it to many users or if you want to repeat the process over time. An alternative approach to audience segmentation is to perform supervised machine learning. And the first step in supervised learning is to create a labeled data set by essentially just going through the deductive coding exercise that we uh, just got through. And so with this labeled data, we then split, the, split it into a training and a test set where on the training data, you uh, use it to develop a model to predict the categories of interest. And on the test set, you evaluate the trained model's performance on new data that it hasn't seen before. The strengths of this approach are, assuming your model's accurate enough to meet your goals, is that it's relatively easy to scale to users outside the your code to sample and to repeat over time. The limitations are that there's a trade-off in complexity since supervised learning models are more challenging to develop and assess. Now, because of the nice benefits of supervised learning, uh, we've developed several models to support audience segmentation across various social media platforms. And this slide outlines a few that we've published on publicly. The first set of examples are models that we've developed to assign users into predicted age groups with separate approaches for Twitter and for Reddit. These age groups are youth, young adults and adults for Twitter, and adolescents and adults for Reddit. Another example are models for assigned, excuse me, for assigning predicted user types to accounts on Twitter. And these user types include the categories of marketer, individual, news media, public health agency, vaping advocates, and bots. Uh, so to make this, this process a little bit more concrete, for the next two slides, we'll go into some of the details of the Reddit, uh, the Reddit age classification model. So to get labeled data for this model, we search for examples of where Reddit users self-reported their age in their profiles, posts, or comments. We then manually review these accounts to confirm that the self-reports are plausible. And uh, the reason we took this approach was because we weren't confident that we'd be able to accurately assign users to the age groups by just reviewing their public content. And while we felt this approach produced high quality labels, one drawback is that if uh, users who self-report age are systematically different than those who don't self-report age, then our model isn't guaranteed to generalize well to all users. Now in practice, when we use this model, we try to mitigate this impact by uh, limited, uh, limiting predictions to only accounts that look like our training data or for which the model is relatively more confident as being in either group, adolescents or adults. So now that we have the labeled data, the next step is model development. In the model development, uh, is to generate several variables that we believe uh, could help help distinguish between teens and adults on Reddit. Uh, this table on our right outlines various groups of variables that we considered. These include everything from the vocabulary used in the user's posts and comments to what subreddits they most commonly posted or, to or commented on. And finally, after we have the, uh, the features and the labels, we tested several supervised learning algorithms with different deductive biases or assumptions about how they predict observations that they haven't encountered. To aid in interpretation and reduce future data, pi data pipeline maintenance, we also perform variable selection on the derived variables, and we're able to reduce the set from over 1,500 variables to 15 without a significant drop in performance. To evaluate the model's performance, we use cross-validation as well as a test set. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, as an initial check for face validity, we also looked at the associations between each variable in the final model and the outcome. To us, overall, these associations made a lot of sense. Uh, for example, here on the left, relative to adults, teen users had accounts that were created more recently, were more likely to post in popular subreddits, were more likely to post in the teenager subreddit, and were more likely to use the term school. Um, and then uh, relative to teens, adult users tend to write more sentences per comments. They had a higher Coleman readability score, meaning they use longer sentences with larger words than the teen accounts. They were more likely to post in the new subreddit, and they were more likely to use the term home. So now that we've introduced these models for audience segmentation, we wanted to pro provide some examples using them to address the two questions that were posed earlier, who's posting on social media and who's being exposed to this content. This first use case is looking uh, to determine if there are differences in themes about cigarettes between youth and adults on both Reddit and Twitter. Uh, for this, we identified conversations about cigarette smoking, then applied the age prediction models to users that posted about cigarettes, um, and then we did social media listening um, on the final sample of predicted youth and adults. And on the right here are some examples of differences that we observed between the predictive age groups. So on both Reddit and Twitter, adults tended to discuss smoking cessation more than youth. As you can see from the example posts, these are often included as a personal narrative and an expression of regret for starting cigarette use. For example, this tweet here says, never start smoking. The cravings never go away. Um, also, on Reddit, youth were more likely to discuss health consequences of smoking than adults. Uh, this Reddit post here says, uh, before I even started, who wants yellow teeth, bad smell, and cancer? And the pros, that's all. Be cool, don't smoke. OK, and so the second and final case study is focused on vaping and uh, the company Juul in particular. As a little bit of background, in the late 2010s, Juul was by far the most popular end brand in the US, accounting for nearly 75% of sales. Um, additionally, the usage of end products was at the time dramatically increasing in high school students. And based on uh, survey evidence, Juul was also the top brand used by high school students. Social media and Juul's ad strategy of using young adult models and influencers may have contributed to Juul's popularity. However, Juul claimed that they did not target youth and voluntarily initiated plans to address youth access appeal and the use of Juul products. <clears throat> to, to, uh, to check this claim, um, we let it, it led us to ask the question of, are kids being exposed to social media posts by Juul? And to address this qu question, we examined roughly 12,000 accounts following Juul's Twitter account in April of 2018. We then used the, the Twitter age classification model to predict the age of Juul users and found that 80% of followers were predicted to be less than 21, and about 45% of the follower, followers were predicted to be less than 18. We published these results with recommendations to enforce age verification on Juul's social media content to help prevent exposure to these younger audiences. And uh, though these, uh, these results were published back in 2019, they still have relevance today. For example, our findings were referenced in a New York Times article published about two weeks ago um, on a lawsuit between Juul and several state attorney general's offices. Uh, so with that, I'll pass the presentation back to Anise to include recommendations for how to incorporate social media monitoring into your work. Thank you. Great, thanks Rob. So we went over a lot of content um, in the past 20, 20 minutes or so. Um, and so there's, there'll definitely be time for Q&A, but we wanted to also um, provide some high level recommendations for how you may think about incorporating social media monitoring in your work. First and foremost, I think um, it's important to ask yourself this question, do you need to monitor social media? Um, and these are the questions that you should be asking related to that. Do you need continuous surveillance on a health topic? 
Are you monitoring an emerging issue that is rapidly evolving? Do you need early indicators to help inform other research or response efforts? Is there currently no gold standard method for capturing these data? And is your target audience of interest on social media and talking about it? So if you answered yes to these questions and decide to use and incorporate social media listening into your work, we recommend thinking about social media listening or social media monitoring really as, a, as an iterative process. So first, you wanna start off with what is it that you wanna know and really clarify those research questions. Second, where can you look? What social media platforms are gonna be the best places and what tools will you use to examine those conversations? And then three, when you've got all of that set up, looking at those results, are those conversations actually happening online? Sometimes we think there must be people talking about a particular topic. And when we set up the search query, we may find that there's very little volume of conversations. And so I think it's important to look at some of those initial results. And then if there are relevant conversations, what insights can we extract? And then the fifth step, um, are these results helpful? Um, and then after that cycle, going back again through this iterative process, maybe you may wanna adjust your research questions or adjust where you look in terms of the um, social media platform. Um, but really thinking about this as an iterative process where some of the initial um, results that you find then help inform how you move forward next. We wanna underscore the importance of clarifying research questions because there's so much data here, you can just get lost, right? And so research questions really need to drive your social media listening. So sometimes um, clients come to us and they have very specific questions like um, this as an example. Did our campaign influence vaccine hesitant adults to change their attitudes and get vaccinated? So we would, these types of questions are difficult to answer with social media listening because um, in the question you have a very specific audience that you need to try to identify. You have behavioral outcomes that may not be really talked about on social media. And you're also trying to attribute some sort of causal change in terms of a um, specific um, communication effort. Um, instead, we would encourage you to ask these types of questions. What are emerging trends in a particular health topic? How is the public responding to a particular policy? What questions do consumers have and what are they discussing about a particular health topic or policy? And these types of questions are easier to answer with social media because they're open-ended and they're exploratory. They're focused on identifying emerging issues and trends. And these types of questions are um, being asked with the goal of coming up with some early indicators or signals that can inform further research or triangulation with other data. So we want to underscore the importance of triangulating social media data, social media insights with other data sources. Social media data is one data out of a suite of different data sources we all have available to us. And it's important to put that in context. Um, this is an example of a dashboard that we've created where we are helping clients monitor emerging vaping products. Um, and we put data sources um, from a lot of different, um, we're summarizing a lot of different data sources in addition to social media. So for example, we have Reddit data as well as data on Instagram and Twitter that's in the dashboard. But as people are talking about certain brands um, that they're um, discussing on social media, we also look at things like Google search trends. Is the volume of conversations or is the volume of searches about a particular product going up based on Google search trends? What do we see in terms of the advertising expenditure for that brand? Is that brand being advertised across different media platforms? And then what do we see in terms of actual sales? Does that triangulate with retail sales that we're seeing in stores? And as you're working through these questions and looking at some of the different data, it's important to monitor the evolving social media ecosystem and really thinking about where's the signal, what data are available, how you're gonna get it, and what's your budget and resources. 
You can get data directly from the social media platforms by doing searches on the platforms or um, setting up an API, but you can also use other social media listening platforms that do that for you, such as Brandwatch, Sprout Social, and some of the other ones listed here. So there's so much data, what will you measure? Um, and we created this figure um, to kind of summarize the various level of social media analysis um, that you can do, mapped on a scale of difficulty along the x-axis and potential value on the y-axis. So at a minimum, even if you have very limited resources, you should at least start with number one, which is just kind of personal ad hoc monitoring. Get on these platforms, create an account, um, create a separate account from your personal account if you don't want the algorithm um, messing up what you look at personally. Um, and, and follow some of the hashtags related to your topic of interest. Follow some of the accounts that are posting about your health topic and get a, a, get a baseline sense of, are there conversations happening? Um, are there important conversations I wanna pay attention to? Um, and then next, if you've really decided that social media listening is for you, the second step of setting up a social media listening platform. If you have limited resources um, in terms of capabilities like data science, um, the using some of the social media platforms that are available allows you to get started. Um, but it's not, you don't wanna just rely on those metrics alone. I think it's important to also do some qualitative coding. Um, and then if you are going to be doing social media listening at scale and you wanna do things like monthly reports, thinking about developing some computational methods that, uh, that might allow you to scale more quickly and then putting all of that into custom dashboards and triangulating it with other data sources. So as you um, delve into social media listening, um, a, a word of caution, I think we go into this um, space thinking about um, this expectation that with big data and shiny tools, we'll get all these clear, valuable insights in a timely manner, um, when in fact those expectations don't often match reality, right? Um, this data is messy, it's coming at fast speed, and um, it takes time to really kind of make sense of that data. We'd also wanna argue that um, in doing social media listening, um, we need a little bit of a paradigm shift. What we value in science is rigor, validity, control, experimentation, generalizability of findings, and um, we can't always get all of that with social media data. And so what we need is a perspective of being more adaptive, nimble, and lean research, and really valuing the timeliness of the data and thinking about um, what results we're gonna find out about end users we're interested in, and getting those insights faster and disseminating it to other people who can use those insights to inform other work. Um, it's important to think about balancing these trade-offs Often we're on the right side of this um, scale here where we are looking at really rigor, deep dive customization, which are often you know, um, done for the purposes of outcomes like publications and evaluating outcomes and enforcing policies and regulations. Um, but with social media listening data, um, we'd wanna argue that valuing things like signal detection, timeliness, scalability, and frequency to inform outcomes like communication, other data collection, and informing the development of campaigns um, is probably where we would see some more of that value. So we'd encourage everyone to kind of think about the long game. Social media data is not going away, it's here to stay. And so we think that going forward, knowledge of social media data is gonna be even more essential to public health and that it's going to be important for us to continually upskill um, because the platforms are changing all the time and to bring along others along the journey because it really is a, um, a team science. At RTI, we take a multidisciplinary approach where we have data scientists, subject matter experts, and communication scientists at the table to this work. And if you're interested in finding out more about some of our approaches or have questions, um, please don't hesitate to reach out um, and these are our email addresses. Thank you. And with that, Jamie, I'll turn it back over to you. 
Great. Thanks so much, Anise and Rob. Um, before we go ahead and jump into our Q&A session, I just wanted to mention that all um, registered attendees will receive an email in the next few days with links to view the recording from today's session and also um, download today's slides. So I'll go ahead and get started with some questions that came in through the Q&A function. Um, so I'll start out with, do, ha do you have demographic profiles of Reddit users versus Twitter, Twitter users versus Facebook versus other platforms? Probably depends I'm on the sorry, demographics. That... Go ahead, Denise. I, I'm I'm confused about the question. Is it is it a question to Rob in terms of the demographics or just general demographics of users in general? The question came in during the social listening portion, so I think it's more general. But please send a message in the Q and A if uh, that is not what you had in mind. Um, the actual demographics of users, um, so Facebook, I, I don't have the specific statistics right at the tip of my hand, and I would, for the latest data on that, I would refer people to sources like um, Pew, um, as well as Common Source um, Media that also provides some detailed statistics. Um, so we do know that Facebook tends to skew older in terms of age demographics. Um, whereas platforms like Instagram and then for sure um, platforms such as Snapchat and TikTok um, skew younger in terms of age demographics. Um, but whoever asked that question, if you want break out by things like gender and race ethnicity, and sometimes they also stratify that data by um, education level, um, I would refer you to um, look up sources on um, Pew, and I'll put that in the in the chat. Great, thanks, Anise. Okay, the next question is, have you published on your social media listening methodology specifically, or just within your papers on specific analyses? We have published some papers in terms of some of the results we have found. Um, we have been focused um, more on our methods as of late. Um, and, you know, I think one of the um, things that we try to do is that um, depending on the nature of the project, if it's more kind of comprehensive or it's focused on methods, we prioritize publication. Um, but we're also trying to develop kind of a scalable, frequent social media listening or monitoring system. And so sometimes those look like um, PowerPoint slide decks or brief reports on a monthly basis. And those are designed mostly to get um, the latest trends in the hands of um, government agencies who may use that information to then inform the development of their surveys or um, campaign development. And so those don't necessarily um, get published in the way that um, a more comprehensive um, assessment or a methods paper may be prioritized for publication. Great, thanks, Anise. And this next question, I think, um, I think Anise and Rob might have things to say about this, but are there ways to distinguish misinformation from disinformation and consider those nuances in the analysis? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. I would say that when we get down to the messaging at the individual post or comment level, that's usually when it helps to have, um, you know, subject matter experts look at it. Because I think an important part of evaluating and understanding these is to have people who understand the domain and be able to evaluate if something is misinformation or disinformation, which, you know, automated fact checking is kind of a, uh, a wild west frontier in the, <laughs> the data science literature right now. So it's, it's not by any means like a solved problem. Uh, so it still really, I think, helps having um, having people who are familiar with what the, the the subject matter read those and evaluate them. It's a little harder to do at scale, but in certain cases, you could probably do some of it 
or sometimes you might get lucky and be able to do a supervised approach and see that there's a bunch of uh, you know similar claims and say, oh yeah, these are all the same kind of misleading claim or this particular person or this particular account is often has uh, a lot of misinformation and uh, publishes a lot of information, disinformation, and either are a bot or like a an actor who is uh, not working in, in good uh, in good faith, I guess, and uh, you can identify things that way. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to Nice for the rest of that. Yeah, no, I, I don't really have anything more to add there, Rob. I think it really takes um, a mixed methods approach to it. Um, there are obviously computational things you can look at in terms of patterns um, and the networks and, you know, even things like the frequency with, um, you know, how frequently certain messages may be disseminated or propagate through networks that can signal um, sources of misinformation and disinformation. Um, but um, we have also some um, experts here at RTI who are not on the call today, um, who are whose expertise is in understanding misinformation in the public space, Brian Southwell. Um, and so I know that in some of the work that he does as well, um, there is this kind of the importance of what Rob just mentioned of really being able to even classify um, what is a misinformation, right? Um, especially in an evolving space, um, such as the COVID pandemic that um, we're all kind of uh, living through and being and the importance of subject matter expertise at the, at the table in terms of even developing um, data science solutions to, to detect patterns of misinformation and disinformation. Thanks, Anise and Rob. Um, okay, this next one came up, uh, Rob, when you were talking about developing age prediction algorithms um, and just ask, are you manually reviewing user profiles or pulling data from the platform via R or Python? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, different parts, we're doing both. So for example, when um, we're labeling it, we also pull down data on those accounts as well. Um, but uh, usually to, to label the data, um, we find that it's, it's often useful to be able to navigate natively within the platforms to look at the profile and just confirm whether or not something is, uh, um, you know, the, the type that we're, we're interested in or the categories that we're interested in. Uh, to be able to apply these models and to, to build them, we definitely do pull data from the platforms, uh, usually through APIs, but sometimes also through web scraping if we need to. Um, and as Denise mentioned earlier, uh, sometimes we get some of that information from social media listening, though so, uh, it's usually less at the user level. Uh, but there's a bunch of good information at the post and comment level. Great, thanks, Rob. And then this next one um, just came in um, when you were talking about um, misinformation. So I just wanted to ask it while it was at top of mind. So are you training the AI in the social media software to ID misinformation or sentiment? Yeah, so we currently don't have any, we haven't like uh, trained any models to identify misinformation. Um, we have used pre-trained models for sentiment before, and actually sentiment is also often available in social media listening platforms as a field that they derive for you, which is nice in many cases. Um, whether or not that ends up being that useful is kind of context dependent. <laughs> um, but yeah, misinformation is not uh, one that we've done. And I think part of it, the challenge there is that, um, it, it, at least for me, like misinformation kind of implies that there is a correct and a misleading <laughs> Uh, one, and it's not usually, and depending on what the claim is, um, it's going to be tricky normally for a, a model at, to uh, to be able to tease that out since they're not really that good at reasoning. Um, so this has not been a huge priority for us in the short term, but um, I know it's a big uh, problem and something that, you know, given some more thought on the right project, we probably will need to address at some point.
Okay, we have another qu related question that just came in. Wouldn't it be difficult to match sentiment universally for AI in a way that we can discern between opinion versus fact-based claims? Um, so usually I, so when I think about sentiment, it's usually about trying to understand if the user is posting is feeling positive, negative, neutral, or some kind of combination of those things towards a, a subject of interest. Um, and so like, I almost always associate those with opinion or um, attitude kinds of statements as opposed to factual based ones. I guess you could be, you know, angry about a fact or say a fact very angrily or something. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, uh, yeah, I, I often think about sentiment in terms of uh, opinion based uh, statements and claims. I hope I answered that question correctly. I kind of forgot what um, the first part of it was. Um... I think, yeah, that's that's great. Thanks, Rob. Uh, okay, so the next one we have is how do you actually pull data from social media platforms? And this is a Rob question, I think more so. Yeah, so um, it the, the short answer is uh, it depends on the platform. Um, sometimes depending on what you're looking for, um, if you do have a subscription to a social media listening platform, uh, they do a little bit of the hard work for you since they have these enterprise agreements with a lot of different platforms. And um, you can you can get a lot of information uh, directly from them, um, either in aggregate, or you can also grab samples of specific queries of, that you are interested in, and then do various uh, kinds of analyses on them. So if you're interested in a lot of different platforms and uh, you are thinking about an investment, I would um, consider looking at those or partnering with an organization who uh, is familiar with those and can, can help answer those kinds of questions. Um, I would also say that, however, that not all the information that um, they're, they're not perfect in the sense that there are ways to get more information um, from certain platforms that uh, make it available. For example, uh, both Reddit and um, Twitter have uh, pretty full featured APIs to be able to get additional information. Uh, so for example, getting um, information about particular users is a little tricky to do in social media listening platforms um, and particularly links between um, like a followers list and those sorts of things are, aren't even accessible. So even though that API call is uh, has a really uh, prohibitive rate limit, for that particular call, and it takes a long time to do in Twitter, uh, you can actually get that data. It just kind of takes a, a little bit of time to pull. Um, Reddit is actually a, a bit more open, and so you can get um, more stuff from it there. Uh, and then I would say for some of the other platforms that don't have APIs and are more, um, maybe more privacy focused, that uh, sometimes you can web scrape for them, though there are challenges with that. and. Uh, you know, sometimes we're against the the uh, platform's terms of service, so we we do it sometimes, but it, it has to be for a good reason often. Great, thanks for such a comprehensive answer, Rob. Uh, okay, so my next one is: social media is known as a place for spreading false news by bots and by people. What impact do false such false narratives have on your research, and how do you control for them? To what degree does this make social media research less reliable? Um, I will take that one, and Rob, feel free to jump in. Um, and, and Jamie, you as well, because you're also involved in a lot of this research. Um, for sure, um, social media is a place where false information spreads and people as well as bots um, are actors in that phenomenon. Um, what we really try to do is look for some of those emerging themes. And so, um, and then this importance of triangulating it with other data sources to really determine like, is this real or not, right? And so, 
Um, if we see an emerging theme, for example, we will look at some of those posts and see, you know, is there some sort of like faithfulty in terms of what they're talking about in the context of a particular topic. Then we may do some uh, more specific searches on that particular claim to see, okay, how um, how much volume of conversations is there around this particular claim? Particular claim is it really localized to this one person or these set of individuals, or is it pretty widespread? And do we see different types of people talking about it? Um, but ultimately, um, you know, social media data because of its limitations and challenges. Um, aren't generalizable. So we provide these insights and often um, agencies will then look at that and say, okay, well now let me actually put that question in a focus group or an IDI or you know, in-depth interviews or even a survey that we're going to do to actually um, assess um, whether this is a real phenomenon in terms of a belief or a behavior that's emerging. So um, we hear you um, and I think it doesn't necessarily, you know, it, it's social media data should be used with um, other data sources and inform um, further data collection because of these challenges. Great, thanks, Anise. Uh, we actually were talking about this earlier today and that um, really nicely encapsulates our conversation. Um, okay, so our next question, do you have any advice on how to explore social media data in terms of cultural or ethnic differences? I think that could yeah, be for um, either. Mm -hmm. This is a difficult one. Um, we have um, each social media platform has certain types of restrictions in their terms of use about what kind of data you can um, mine and report out. And um, on, some, on some social media platforms, um, data on things like race and ethnicity um, is prohibited in terms of you know, looking for specific um, groups in that way and reporting out results that way. Um, so we haven't done a whole lot in terms of really trying to understand um, specific cultural or ethnic differences by mining um, profiles to predict those characteristics because of some of the potential sensitivities and the restrictions that social media platforms put um, in place. Um, that said, um, there may be um, certain forums or subreddits. I see there's another question um, that's related to this about whether we recommend use of forums um, like Reddit um, to facilitate audience segmentation. So to the extent that there may be some subreddits that are, and subreddits are really like communities of interest that are self-organized around a particular interest or a topic or affiliation. So to the extent that there are subreddits um, that already exist out there that are public, um, that are talking about certain kind of cultural or ethnic um, topics that are of interest, then that may be a place where um, the group has already self-organized publicly. Um, but kind of beyond that, we haven't done a whole lot in terms of mining for that specific demographic information. Um, because of some of the um, challenges and limitations. Yeah, I would just, yeah, I would agree. It's it's challenging because at one on some level, like, you know, having that race and ethnicity kind of variable in your data allows you to start looking at health disparities and other kinds of things that are really important. Um, but at the same time, um, it's right, uh, restricted on many um, platforms about in their terms of service um, and it's kind of uh, probably challenging to do consistently well from a model. Uh, I, th I think that if we were to do it, I think this is um, might be a looking at specific subreddits or looking for people self-reporting their, their race and ethnicity might be the way, even though, again, that's not the, you're not getting a representative uh, uh, slice of the of all people in those groups. Great, thanks, Anisa Rob. I think that's also addressed our next question about um, using uh, Reddit um, subreddits to facilitate audience segmentation. Um, I so that is that 
takes us through all of the questions that have come in through the Q&A and chat. I actually had a couple questions of my own um, that I thought I would shoot to you all. Um, as I thought folks might be interested in the answers to these questions. Um, so the first one is I'm interested in understanding how vape marketers are using YouTube. Uh, what are some ways that I could use YouTube data to provide insights into these marketing practices? Um, so YouTube um, is searchable to a certain extent. Um, and so you can do obviously some manual search queries if you wanna start there, right, within YouTube and see what kind of results come up. Um, you can also um, do some keyword searches and use the YouTube API, which Rob can talk a little bit more about um, to identify relevant um, types of videos of interest. Um, and then once you've identified those, then um, you would do some coding um, by either viewing the videos or um, analyzing the transcript of the content in the videos through some more um, computational kind of text analysis. But Rob, if you wanna say more there about the specifics of using the YouTube API, please chime in. Yeah, um, thanks Anise. Yeah, uh, we didn't really touch much on YouTube as um, some of the other platforms, but um, it does have a, a full um, well supported API um, that you can get information about uh, individual videos. You can do essentially the same thing as you would within the platform of like searching for certain keywords or, you know, on certain topics and returning videos um, in, a, in a list form, that kind of thing, as well as being able to collect things like the comments and engagement on uh, YouTube comments, the description within the um, the video, and other things like the title and sometimes the transcript. Um, you can, if you have the URL that the original video, um, do a little bit more work if you really want to and do some video capture, which you can potentially do, you know, computer vision and uh, video analytics kinds of work on. But, um, you know, to the extent that's going to be helpful is really dependent on the research question or the amount of effort that you might go into developing those. Thanks, Rob and Anise. Um, I think we have time for one more quick question. If anyone has anything, any uh, lingering, burning questions, so um, feel free to pop that into the Q and A. Um, and if not, I have one more question that I I might ask if we don't hear from anyone else. I might just quickly ask my question, which is, um, can you tell me a little bit more about analysis capabilities that are available for TikTok data? Sure, I know everyone's interested in TikTok. Um, TikTok is um, starting to make some of their data available. So we've been closely monitoring um, the release of their API, their application programming interface to allow researchers to mine that data. Um, some of the social media listening platforms are starting to um, incorporate um, TikTok data into their platforms. Um, but right now, um, it's been kind of more focused on um, targeted searches of hashtags and um, reviewing some of the video content results from that. But I think there will be more that will be rolled out um, with, the, um, with the API release. Thanks, Anise. So uh, we're at the top of the hour. So just as a reminder, um, today's presentation was the fourth in RTI's Tech Talks webinar series. Um, you can check out rti.org for more information and to register for our upcoming webinars. And thanks so much, everyone, for attending and to our speakers.